Friends, welcome to Leadosophy. You're here with an open mind because that is the rule. And not the exception. I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Jess Ica Schaefer. Yeah, you get stuck on the Ica. That's yeah. why I never say it. Yeah, she calls herself Jess. She likes Jess. No, I like Schaefer. Oh, she likes Schaefer. Yeah, so today's episode, we're going to talk about an article in the Journal of Healthcare Leadership. It's about followership, almost wholly about followership. And we'll talk mm-hmm. about a few other areas, probably in the leadership and organizational, effectives, uh, organizational effectiveness a little bit. Um, so here we go. Hope you like this episode. Take it away. Greetings, friends. I am Tim Woody, and welcome to Leadosophy. Leadosophy is the fusion of leadership and philosophical thought. Together, we will deepen our understanding of leadership using the tools of meaningful dialogue, reflection, and a general curiosity to learn from one another. We will crowdsource knowledge, staying within the bounds of leadership, followership, team dynamics, and organizational effectiveness. I hope you enjoy the show. Here we go. All right, friends, here we go. I'm with again with with Jess, my wonderful co-host who comes on occasionally. Occasionally, a little bit more frequently these days. You're about uh, once every 30 or 40 episodes you get on here, so... Well, if you consider the season two, I feel like I've made two robust. Two out of six. Yeah, yeah this is this is the sixth episode of, of season two. So today's episode, Jess and I are going to talk about mainly followership. You like followership, right? Love it. She loves followership. It's one of her favorite subjects. And I, she's actually pulled me into the followership camp. I, over my last especially five years, I've focused a lot on leadership and leadership development and how leadership applies to organizational effectiveness. But Jess has definitely, over the last few years, has definitely made me realize the importance of effective followership. And we're all followers. You know, you can take any organization, uh, no matter what size, no matter what industry, and everybody's a follower, all the way up to the CEO, because even the article we're going to talk about today mentions that a CEO responds to a board of directors. You know, they're accountable to someone else. Everyone has a boss. Everyone has a boss. And I always say a boss is boss. You can play that game out at infinitum forever. So we're going to talk about an article titled Building Individual and Organizational Wellness Through Effective Followership. It's in the Journal of Healthcare Leadership. It was actually published this year, uh, April, I believe. And it was written by Lauren Weber, Jessica Bunnan, and Joshua Hartzell. So this article specifically, Jess and Jess has read it as well. So we're going to kind of, we're going to hit some highlights of it. We're not going to spend all night talking about it, but we're going to spend a little bit of time kind of hitting some highlights. So this article was written largely for the healthcare industry, but as we've already mentioned, this definitely has carryover to other industries, uh, no matter what size the organization we've all, we're going to talk about burnout, right? That's going to be one of the things we're going to talk about specifically uh, this, this idea or this concept of burnout. And if you've been in an organization long enough, you've probably experienced burnout. I know I have experienced burnout. Jess, you probably experienced burnout, right? Absolutely. So that's kind of the the main kind of the main the central concept or, or idea in the article is burnout among physicians and how physicians can be effective followers and how can they can counteract that that burnout. So one of the first things I want to I want to talk about specifically is kind of the the causes of burnout. And I'm going to read a, just a little paragraph in here because I think it's really important for me. It's kind of okay. Why do you get burnout, right? And I think there's going to be a lot, again there's going to be a lot of carryover from physician burnout to other industries. So as I read this quick paragraph, just a couple sentences. Um, this is the causes of burnout for physicians. Burnout has numerous causes. The authors write, but many of them re- relate to feeling helpless in our workplaces, workspaces. Individuals cite lack of ownership, autonomy, and purpose as common contributors to burnout. Depersonalization, decreased empathy, and lack of quality feedback add additional fuel to a situation that often culminates in feelings of moral distress for physicians. Many of these causes are rooted in dysfunction within the leader-follower relationship. Jess, do you have any initial thoughts about that paragraph? So my initial thought was this was not the root cause of burnout. This was the definition of burnout. That's okay. So, you yeah. were, so the root cause is the very last sentence is that many of these causes are rooted in the dif- dysfunction of the leader follower relationship. Right. So and we've spent time in root cause analysis, right? We have. Yes, we have. Um, but taking a note from you, which I'm really shocked you didn't do, because you're always like, well, what it, you know, what does that mean? I I felt like we had to start with what is burnout. 
because the primary assumption of this article is burnout is widespread. That so is a very is, broad assumption, yes. Yeah, so what is burnout and how are we measuring burnout, right? So um, I'm not really sure that I ever saw like how they necessarily got into it. And I'm not disagreeing that it's widespread, so let me start there. I'm not saying it's not widespread, I'm not saying anything, but I'm always just curious as to know why somebody thinks the way they do. Um, so a paragraph above that, it is burnout is insomnia, anger, impaired memory, decreased attention, moral distress, feeling helplessness, depersonalization, decreased empathy, and lack of quality feedback. So to me, that paragraph and the paragraph before it weren't necessarily the root causes of burnout. It's more like symptoms, right? Yeah. Or, you know, signs and symptoms, I guess. But that was more what people would say they experience and then they title that burnout. Right. Um, and then the only thing that I felt like they really, you know, kind of left out. And again, I'm not disagreeing with anything is how individual this is. This is very subjective to the person experiencing it. I agree. hundred percent. So, yeah. That's kind of where I was at. So we've talked about burnout a little bit and have you in your long Coast Guard career, how would you how do you think about burnout? Like what, what comes to mind when you just kind of like personalize it and you don't need specifics. I'm just talking general terms. Cause I can talk about too, a little bit things, a little come symptoms that I've had about burnout and what burnout means to me according to my coast guard career and in, in my military history. But do you have any initial thoughts about what is burnout for you? Like, what is that? So I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was a little interesting that they relate insomnia to burnout. Because when I'm burnt out, all I want to do is sleep. Like, I'm all I want to do is sleep. I'm, I'm not staying awake. I is just, that, do you think that's because you've given so much energy? That's, I don't know. Yeah. I just, I found that interesting that they, that they likened insomnia to burnout. When to me, if I am at my, if I'm angry, if I have impaired memory, if I'm in moral distress, if I'm feeling helpless or decrease empathy, you know, it, it, those are kind of almost like, maybe little symptoms of depression or something, you right. know, not saying that I've necessarily felt that, but when I feel all of these things, I actually feel exhausted and I don't want to, I just don't want to wake up. Right. So I go the opposite way. Um, it's, I don't know. I always, I always just succumb to it a little bit because I've learned through all the mass um, things and methods and, you know, being an athlete that your body heals best when it's asleep. So I try not to fight it. I know a lot of people that, you know, describe not being able to sleep. And there's some sort of rite of passage with not being able to sleep. Like, you're truly worried if you can't sleep. And for me, I've always had a career where you sleep when you can because you never know when you're going, not going to have another opportunity. Yeah. Or have another opportunity. And then number two, I have just read countless... Um, articles and I've been told how healthy it is if you can can repair how much repair your body goes through if you do get a chance to sleep right so so I've I interviewed you once before in the first season about your uh, response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and you were there for two weeks mm -hmm. did you experience what you would classify as burnout at any point during that time so again and you were going like what 12 14 hours a day I mean, easy I'd wake up at 6 30 in the morning or I would wake up at 6 six thirty, which isn't actually that early it's just you have to remember we didn't have electricity we didn't have a lot of power so you kind of had to wait until you know generators were turned on pumps like you couldn't really get your day going until like 6 30 or 7 anyway so i'd wake up at 6 30 in the morning and i would charge until 9 10 at night and then there was just this point at least in what i was doing there where you couldn't do anything else so you had to do the one thing that was probably the healthiest for you at the time which was, I'm going to say jam some water in honor of uh, Mark, Pete, and Brayton. Jam some water, take a knee, take a nap, and get some food. Yeah. So it's just like you have to shut down. You have to repair so that you can get that energy to go out the next day because I just always feel ragingly ineffective when I'm tired. So I think we've, I've started to, as I was listening to you, I've started to see it. There's a difference between a physical burnout and a mental burnout. Oh, absolutely. Right? I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. So I think, I th think what this article we've been, we've been discussing about, it's, you know, again, titled building individual and organizational wellness through effective leader for through effective followership. 
uh, I think the crux of this article talks more about mental mm-hmm. burnout, right? But physical burnout is a thing. Well, and in a case like Maria, I was physically burnt out as well. Right. I was on my feet. I was borrowing, like we didn't, we were sharing vehicles, so I was walking a lot. We were, I was physically and mentally burnt out. And sometimes I've found that when I'm not mentally burnt out enough to sleep, then I, if I'm physically burnt out, my body will want to sleep anyway. Right. So. But you were burnt out. I, can I suggest you were burnt out in a good way? It was, you were yeah, in a very, it, there for a very noble that, cause. You know, and you've done risk management. You've, you've taught you know, risk and you've looked at mishap analysis, there is a good deal of positive stress that a person can endure. Right. It's just how long you can endure it. Um, where positive stress over a long period of time then turns into negative stress. So I would agree that that was very positive stress because even though it was frustrating and, you know, complicated and, you know, challenging at times, you were still, um, you still had, what is it, autonomy? Autonomy, uh, mastery, mastery, and purpose. purpose. So you still had some pretty good purpose. We were still trying to do the right, do good things. So I think that's been the fortunate thing about my career is even when I was kind of lacking maybe personal autonomy, mastery, and purpose, um, I could always, I've always been in a position to help somebody else find theirs. And so then they're establishing my mastery and my purpose and my autonomy. Right. So it's kind of always worked out that way. So that's a good segue. Uh, the the authors of this article um, reference Daniel uh, Daniel uh, Pink. Pinker, Pink. Daniel Pinker, right? I think it's just Pink. We'll have to Daniel get the Pink. yeah. We we'll have to get the yeah Daniel I'll Pink. Get it for you. Yeah. So the the book she references or the authors references Drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think it's Daniel, Daniel Pink. Pink. Yeah, Daniel Pink wrote the book Drive, which is a very fascinating book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, but they they reference he talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose as far as motivation, intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation. So back to this article when they're talking about how do you become an effective follower, the authors really talk about uh, partnering up with the leader, right? So there's, in every organization, you have a leader-follower dynamic, right? You can't, you, without followers, there are no leaders. It's the bottom line, or minimum of two people to have leadership. So if you take the, the very basic construct of leader-follower dynamic of two people, uh, the authors mention that forming a partnership, the, the followers have to try to form a partnership with leadership, right? And I agree with that. I think it definitely is, it's got to be a partnership uh, for, for it to work, for that team dynamic or that leadership followership dynamic to, to work. Do you think it necessarily has to be a partnership with the actual physical leader or a partnership with organizational goals or a partnership with, you know, their, their own personal goals? Like, I, th- I know maybe I followed somebody not because I thought that I agreed with them, but because it was what was best for me in my life at the time. Like, does that partnership always just solely have to be between the leader and the follower? So I, I think that's a good question. I think a partnership between a leader and follower, uh, it, you have to go back and forth. I mean, you can't, you have to obviously, if you're within an organization, the leader-follower partnership has to focus first and foremost on achieving your organizational goals. That's got to be the primary objective of forming a partnership between a leader-follower dynamic, Right. It's achieving the goals because what else are you there for, right? You have to achieve organizational goals. Without achieving the organizational goals, we can extrapolate that the organization will cease to exist over time, right? So, yeah. so, it, so I think you have the organizational goals on one side. I think if you separate the leader from the follower and you have them as individuals, each of those individuals have personal goals, right? And I think why shouldn't there be some sort of partnership between leaders trying to achieve some personal goals? Because I believe that in, if you're in an organization, you should be able to simultaneously, and maybe not right at the exact same time, but you should be able to help the organization achieve the, the over the broad, broad goals, but you should be able to also be able to achieve some personal goals too, whether that's growth within the organization or growth in your personal life. Like there's other goals other than just organizational goals. Well, what I'm saying is if you have a designated leader, so, you know, I've worked for many people over the last 20 years. Um, Some I've really enjoyed working for, others maybe not so much, but I've definitely had one that was a real challenge and a real struggle for me. And I very much so disliked everything about his leadership style as it pertained to me. Um, Everybody else seemed to be kind of okay with it. so I wasn't necessarily following because I was really interested in doing a very good job. 
but my interest wasn't int- I had zero interest in doing a good job to to please him or to meet his goals. And there was going to be no partnership, right? No partnership with that individual. I mean, to be quite frank, I felt like I was trying to have one, but it wasn't being reciprocated at all. Um, So in the end of the day, it didn't really matter because I had a great partnership with the organizational goals. Right. You know, so I didn't necessarily have what I would consider a great leader follower relationship per, you know, that wasn't the partnership that was driving me or giving me that autonomy, mastery, and purpose. It was the organization that was giving me that autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And that's what allowed me to survive that less than ideal situation right. and also to, you know, surpass it. Right. There were also, would you say you had peers around you as well that maybe, I don't know if you classify as a partnership, but maybe you had peers that kind of helped you overcome. I think the best thing that my peers did at that point in time was realize that where I stood in that, in that relationship. Right. And so while they couldn't fix it, they couldn't change it. And, um, they just, the, just the simple acknowledgement, um, that it was not an ideal situation, Sure. but also the acknowledgement that they very much so had a great relationship with the same individual. Um, I just wasn't, fortunate enough to have one with them so um well know, that's that's their acknowledge acknowledgement alone was was good yeah and uh, one of the questions i posed in my facebook group was what do you do if you know if you know the authors talk about there's got to be a partnership you know it's sh- there should be effort from the follower to form a partnership with 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 their leader but what if it's a one-way street you know what if you are trying as a follower to pursue a partnership with with whoever's above you in the hierarchy and it's just not reciprocated. You know, how do you handle that? You mentioned that, you know, luckily you had strong enough connection to the organizational goals that that fueled your fire, so to speak. Absolutely. But if you the don't have that. The job itself was fueling my fire. Right. So you found meaning and purpose in what you were doing, the purpose mm-hmm. of the organization and your day-to-day pursuit of competence in, in your craft. Right. But Correct. not everyone has that. Right. So if, you know, if, and unfortunately, yeah, not everyone has that. Sure. You know. But sometimes it can be as simple, in, in my opinion, as I think your cousin mentioned it. What about the McDonald's worker? Do you think that they're really, you know, vested in that organizational climate and goals moving forward? Nothing wrong with McDonald's. And I, I don't know if I would be that upset to work there just because, I mean, you're feeding people at a reasonable price. And it was one of the only places open during COVID when we were anywhere. So it was right. strategically vital to us for last minute meal runs, et cetera. So it's a very vital organization, but if you don't necessarily identify with that specific portion of it, that doesn't mean you don't want to work there. However, you can appreciate that it provides you a certain lifestyle, money, income, you know, you know, some sort of um, personal mastery and personal purpose. Like, right. I think that's a good. So you mentioned the McDonald's scenario which came up last week which i like i like that organizational uh, effectiveness model that, right so uh the authors reference a book uh ira wrote a book called the courageous follower and in his book he talks about the four types of he kind of breaks down followers into four types which i found really interesting and when i think about the mcdonald's example say the say the 16 year old kid who gets a job working you know he's a cashier or whatever um, one of the follower types ira mentions is resource follower and the traits of a resource follower, he writes, are low level of support for change, unlikely to challenge a leader, does their work often well, but no more. Uh, the advantage is that they're reliable, they're knowledgeable in their field. And we could say maybe 16 year old working cash register for a couple months is probably pretty knowledgeable at their job. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and consistent follow through. Right. Which, you know, I've talked to a lot of people through in a lot of different industries, and sometimes it's hard finding consistent people. Reli- reliability and consistency. Right. And the disadvantages of the resource follower, unwillingness to change may limit organizational progression and an unwillingness to challenge may let the leader go unchecked and uncorrected if they veer off course. So I would think if we if keep the McDonald's example and the 16, 17 year old teenager, um, probably there's probably not a whole lot of huge change initiatives in the organization. Right. At the McDonald's franchise level at the, you know, the restaurant on the corner. And if there is a change initiative, the, I mean, the 16, 17 year old kid is probably just going to go with it, yeah. right? Do what they're told. And uh, if he do, if he, he or she sees any issues with it, probably not going to say a whole lot about it. 
So I agree. I think that you could find all four of these in any organization. Um, you know, we, we keep saying McDonald's. I feel like we're going to get with some franchise tax from some random thing. But I think what we're talking about is just those uh, general jobs where you, um, like, for example, that 16, 17-year-old, you know, you know, your youngest son working at Dairy Queen. Right. Right. Um, I don't think that the organization is set up for the other type of relationships. It's not looking for a partner, an implementer, an individualist. Whereas if you went to, what was it, In-N-Out Burger, where you had to have a high school degree to even work there, to apply there. So you had to have a degree to work there. Um, you go to Starbucks, for example, and they, they will fund your college degree. Um, so they'll pay for you to go to college. So. I feel like some organizations are setting up the expectation that you will be able to meet the partner, follower type, the implementer, the individualist, and then others. And I actually don't know because I haven't worked it. I don't think either one of us has worked at McDonald's. You never worked fast food. Never. Oh, that's right. I worked at a movie theater. That's right. So at your movie theater, did you feel like that structure was even set up? They weren't even asking you to be more than just that worker. Yeah, and I worked, you know, it's a great great uh, segue into my early, my first job uh, at a movie theater. I uh, was 16 years old, 16, 17, uh, almost into my senior year, actually. Uh, I started off as an usher, right, just kind of tearing tickets and, you know, uh, next seat theater on the left, number six, you know, second theater on the right, number nine, whatever it was. Uh, so I started off there and it was very, I mean, it was not difficult work, right? And yeah. I would say the structure, the organizational structure, if I could look back on it, it's, you know, it's easy to look back now through a lens in the filter of a 44 year old with a career behind me and everything else. But I would say that the organization was set up to uh, satisfy the clients, right? That was what it was there for. That's why it was there to exist. And I was just a cog in the machine. And that's, I mean, looking back on it, I, I, I think I had autonomy, autonomy, uh, up to the point to where you probably had a little bit of mastery. You know, yeah, to hear this. Yeah, I did. I definitely. I after they weren't on your phone back then. You had to like actually have. After it. about a few months working there, I felt very confident in what I was doing there. Like cleaning theaters was a whole art form to cleaning movie theaters. Um, you know, stocking popcorn, like popping popcorn, all that stuff. There was a whole art to it, and I felt confident in it, and I enjoyed. You know, it was one of those things as a seventeen-year-old. Like when you're training someone new, it's almost like. You know, you got to break into the industry here. Like, I've been popping popcorn for three months. I know how to do this, right? I know how to fill the candy machines and clean the theater. So you get this kind of like, Theater 7 is mine, man. That's This is my theater. So don't screw the uh, cleaning process up. So That's the one missing all the ceiling tiles? Yeah, probably. But, yeah, I think as far as the, you know, I think about followership, though. Was I a good follower back then? Uh, did I ever get burnout? No, I didn't ever get burnout. The only time I got burnout, really, was like when I had to work on, like, Christmas or Thanksgiving because... If you've ever been in the movie theater industry, they're open 365, right? They're open every day of the year. So that was, but it was, it wasn't hard work, you know? But and was that really burnout or was that just lack of? Well, that was just like a fear of missing out, right? Yeah. You weren't with your family for Christmas and you were, you know, tearing tickets or whatever. But um, the organizational structure of the, the uh, movie business I was working at was, uh, I thought it was very well ran. The managers were very competent in their job uh they were very nice um i felt like they were very personable i never felt deep person you know one of the things they mentioned in the in the article here is dehumanization i never got that or never felt that from any of my managers we had like four or five managers it was a large movie theater i think we had 14 theaters um uh movie screens but did you ever feel that you were being groomed so i know you know in my hometown you worked at the hot dog stand or the ice cream stand um i can tell you I don't ever remember there being anything above what you were doing. You were working at the ice cream stand, you were serving ice cream, you were making scoops, but there was not a, there was no, there was only, they didn't, the thing was is the business didn't need any other managers, so there was no like, there was no upward mobility. Yeah, so. so I, it's just, it was just flat. Yeah, so I, I, I have an opposite experience. So the, the, the guy who trained me, and, and when I look back on it, after like a week or two, I really looked up to this guy. He was probably a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. um, he may have been, you know, maybe pushing 19 or 20. 
um, he's the one who trained me and he kind of had a whole group of like three or four of us that was teaching out of clean theaters and he was like the head usher. And I remember after I was there a couple of weeks, I'm like, man, the head usher, that's kind of cool. I don't know why I was kind of drawn to him, but he had a, he had a great personality. Um, he was super nice. Uh, he never like belittled us or whatever. So after I was there like three or four months, um, they promoted him to an assistant manager. And I remember when he got promoted thinking that, oh man, I can make like a system manager if I worked hard enough. I actually remember thinking this, if I worked hard enough, obviously it never worked out. I, you know, life took me in other directions, but I did. There was that, I think that because that because was a, of the size of the it was a very big, yeah, it was, yeah. I, I can't remember. When you're remember, working yeah. in a smaller organization. So for example, I know that the same, this was like AMC, yeah. but just a different version. This so. is like, I'm talking small hometown, little, little, little right. shop where, the same person that had trained my sister, I was forewarned that she was like, you know, a ice cream terrorist and you better not mess up. Yeah. And my sister, just for retro for perspective is she was a senior when I was a freshman. So we had a little bit of space. So it's like, you're not, you know, the same person's there, you know, you're not going to take that person's job. That person's not going to move on. Right. Um, you know, I'm sure she eventually did, but, so I was just going back to this. I don't think that sometimes while I, I enjoyed reading about the different four types of followers, and I'm sure in the healthcare industry, that this is something that very much so exists. I don't believe that every organization is set up to have the potential to meet all four. And so the four were, I know we talked about one. Yeah, and this was the, the again, the authors were referencing another author another mm -hmm. book and they were just bringing this up as a segue into kind of their their ideas so they put forth their ideas of what effective followership in another table yep. which we'll briefly talk about but yeah so you know the, they reference uh again the author is ira shelliff and he talks about partner is the kind of the highest pinnacle of followership and that's the person who supports change um it will challenge a leader in a respectful manner it's kind of like I think you would see that in more sophisticated organizations where you have a high high chance of upper mobility, right? And you're looking for people like that that will kind of challenge the status quo respectfully, right? They know how to push just enough, but it's probably because they probably have high technical competence and they are also showing signs, symptoms of effective leadership as well, right? So probably easier said than done. But So yeah, they talk about the partner, the implementer, the resource follower, and the individualist individualist is the lowest form this author writes about you know they're basically always resisting change they're basically a cancer to the to the organization nine times out of ten we've all yeah, seen we've people all like seen that it. right they they always complain uh every idea is stupid every leader they work for sucks right there's just people out there like that and you know they just can create a toxic environment so yeah and they say an advantage to the inv individual is provides balance check to the uh leader an individualist, if that's a positive thing on an individualist, that's great. But the, the ones that have met the uh, traits of, you know, resist change, challenges the leader often without respect and rarely offer solutions. Somebody who's rarely offering solutions uh, doesn't really meet the uh, provides, you know, a balance check to the leader for me. That just means that they're just being painful to be painful because that's what they enjoy. So, um, but again, I think... Individualist and resource, I think almost every organization in which there's a leader and a follower dynamic, you will you can probably almost always see one of those, but you may not see, you know, the others. Just yeah. may not call for it. Organization may not call for it. Yeah, when I think of followership, I think of, so the authors of the of the, the article here, they, they talk about, in reference to burnout, right, where we talked about, you know, powerlessness, being dehumanized, um, not feeling that they, they can contribute to the to the workplace, the authors dive into okay how how does how do the physicians counteract that, right? And they and they basically say that well, effective followership can counteract some of those feelings of being powerlessness, right, or being powerless. So well, and I think that's what I loved about the article is because this is the first one I've met or first one I've read. Sorry, I'm shuffling papers because I didn't get the iPad version like this guy did. That's all right. I got the old school paper version where I had to make like handwritten notes. Um, what I really enjoyed about the article was the first time, and I can't even remember. Yeah. So it was the first time where, and I, and I hope if you find any interest in it, you will actually look at it because there are some really good graphics that are involved yeah. and really on their table too. It was kind of the first time that I had seen what I had always wanted. So 
moving through my career, I've been evaluated on leadership for the last 18 out of my 19 out of my 20 years in the service. But I am, while I do have some leadership roles, I don't feel like I've spent the bulk of my career in a leadership position. But I'm always graded on it, right? So I looked at this and I was like, all right, so how could we, I thought this was cool because I'm like, this is a great table for how you could measure effective followership. Now we're talking about the second table that the authors came second up table, with, right? Increasing yeah. wellness through effective followership. Yeah, that's the name of the, 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 the table. Yep, so they named some category, or there's some character, you know, categories, effective followership, so takes initiative, right? So if a person takes initiative, how does that impact the leader-follower situation, impact on the follower wellness? It increases a sense of purpose. I think you could definitely put this in an evaluation. You could definitely strive to teach us. This is something I thought was cool, again, about the article, is there's teachable things in here. Right. You know, there's goals to strive for. Research is problems to provide context. Like, I actually was like, that was that's one of my favorite things to do, is if I see a problem, I try to, like, root out. And this is from the follower perspective, right? From the right? follower perspective. Yeah. Propose solutions. Um, take ownership of team, team failures. Provide constructive criticism to colleagues and supervisors and superiors. Acknowledge the work of others and a volunteer to assist with change. Like... I could make, I could take our current, I just felt like I could take our current evaluations in, in, in the Coast Guard, dump half the leadership stuff, and put about... One, two, three. Are you talking like officer evaluations? Enlisted yeah. officer, I've done right. both. I'm saying yeah. I could put these seven categories. The only one I, I didn't necessarily, I, I couldn't get on board with is handles disagreements in private. I'll be honest, I'm not sure how that, I think that's a good judge of character per se, not leader. necessarily followership specific. No, yeah. I think that's just, and I don't know, like, I don't know. I, you know, their, their goal for that, because they have a goal next to it. So in taking initiative, you increase your sense of purpose. Taking ownership, you decrease depersonalization. Handles disagreements in private, in private increases empathy. That was a stretch for me on that one. Yeah. I wasn't getting there with that. I'm not really sure how, uh, you Where have was your it? Your little iPad version. How does taking initiative, or no, re researching problems to provide context? That's okay. Yeah, so, I guess I get. I see yeah, that. Yeah, I totally see that. Yeah. Right, increases sense of ownership, and I think there's another big key thing that does as well. It increases your sense of ownership. It increases an understanding of the process for the follower, and really, if you have a leader that's totally taxed with like nine million different things. And you are the follower that has that bandwidth to really dive into one particular topic. This just happened to me the other day at work, actually. Like, my my leader is inundated with 5,000 things. As a follower, I'm like, sir, let me take that one thing. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like that's Does that, do you feel empowered when you do that? Or does it? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, you feel helpful. Um, you feel trusted. Um you know, if, if the leader is willing to absolutely. let that go and or let if, that task even go. Even if they look at you and they say, listen, I can't for this reason, or, you know, maybe they just personally want to, that's cool too. But I think that that is something, I just really like this table because I really felt like there were categories that had measurable where you could look at it and say, I could develop a course on followership the right. same way leadership has been shoved down my throat for years. Right. And I think it would just be as equally, equally as significant. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Again, you've always said it, right? Not everyone wants to be a leader. No, and not everybody can. Right. If you're in a room of 50 people and there's a task at hand, how many leaders do you need and how many will evolve? Right, and that's both designated and kind of like situational, who just kind of shows up to the plate mm -hmm. and takes over. And I think, you know, we've been in a lot of situations where, especially if it's, you know, if you're working on a project or you have a task to achieve where there's not really you know, kind of the hierarchy of rank isn't that big of a deal. It's kind of like, who's the most competent to take over this task? They become a functional leader and not necessarily the one who on papers is a leader. So um, everyone else will kind of take a followership role, even if not, even if they're actually designated a leader on paper, right? They're going to take a functional uh, backseat to that as well. Uh, there's an interesting paragraph um, I wanted to read in here. And the authors write, quote, Commitment to serve a boss or organization is generally not something 
physicians lack. So this is kind of back to, to the physician side. And again, we're thinking wider application as we, we talk about this. Because there are many contributors to burnout that cannot be fixed by our behavior alone, it is important to realize why we serve. Why we serve, right? The why bef- behind what are we doing? What's our purpose? The why is an important aspect of burnout prevention. And they go back to Daniel Pink. Pink specifically described the importance of purpose in motivating employees. We have encountered groups of physicians who have lost beloved leaders to burnout. Each time they remark that they wish they had known because they might have been able to help. Right? This is where a follower's commitment to serve plays a role. Does that strike you like with anything? I, I think about I think about my career when I was in command of units. I kind of think back to like how many people did I see leave the service that were really good performers that maybe if I would have just understood that they were burnout, maybe I could have saved them. Not that they needed to save. I'm sure they're successful in other things, but um, I, I know there were, I know there were definitely really high performers um, that I worked with in my career that left the service because they were burnout. Yeah. And, and I think it goes back to this other table that they had. Um, so again, I don't, it's, if you look at the diagram, so there's leader burnout and there's follower burnout, right? So you're talking about follower burnout, but it's a, it's a tricky thing. So who do we usually burn out? You said it already. You said that we usually burn out our top performers, right? Right. Why do we usually burn them out? I mean, there's multiple reasons why we burn out. Usually it's the top performers because they, they take on all the workload Mm -hmm. and it's not that they, well, they take it on, but it's usually forced upon them. Yes, because right. 10% you know of the people do 90% of the work. Because yep, you know it's going to get handled. You know it's going to be great. Right. And you don't have to worry about it. So you tend to you tend to overburden. Those who perform really well tend to get um, a little bit abused. Um, sorry so about if we, well, person. we can stop right there. Based on this article, the follower owns resp- has accountability in that. Correct. The follower has to say, you know what? I'm already, I got too much going on. Give it to so-and-so. Sure. But Which is easier said than a, done. Yeah, and you have to create an environment in which the follower then feels empowered, is empowered to, say to, that, to say that. Correct. Right? Um, which that is easier said than if done. if a leader doesn't do those things, then a leader could possibly get burnout because if you give it to a less capable person or a less willing person, then it takes that much more is put on the leader to ensure that that gets done where they could give a project to a good high performer and have very little effort and seeing the, you know, the high performers are going to knock it out of the park, good to go, done. But if you give it to the person that's the low performer, then you could potentially experience leader burnout because now you're going to have to check up more often. You're going to have to facilitate more. You're going to have to correct more. You're just going to have to provide good point. more mentorship. So it is a tricky, um, again, I, I like that diagram in this, um, that you, there's just like, there's a very bizarre balance right. in that. Yeah, and then basically the diagram just talking about it's basically if you have leader leader and follower burnout, you're basically going to have complete dysfunction within the organization, mm-hmm. right? And obviously, is the more leaders and the more followers that are burnout, right, the more dysfunction you're going to have. So, yeah. all right, do you have any other final thoughts? Oh, it was a really good article. I, you know, yeah, I'll put really the really I'll put the link in the show notes. But you know, it was a it was a short article. It was kind of to the point, mm-hmm. and I think there's a, you know there's a lot of things in this article where it's easier said than done, right? It's easy. I, to, that was going to be my one thing is it's just, it's a very optimistic article. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's easy to say that followers should be, uh, take you, ownership and take, solve yeah, problems. Right. Followers can enhance their own sense of mastery and purpose. You know, it, it again, love the article. Um, but it, it was, which I don't even know if I'm upset at it for being optimistic. I think a little bit of my jaded pessimism from, you know, having a 20 year career, creeps in where it's like but it's not that easy but it's not that easy you know you read these words on paper and it's like challenging is uncomfortable but vitally necessary aspect of following of any leader following relationship and it's like that is such an oversimplification it's right it's correct yeah it's theory as well yes but it's also just like yeah that is a massive oversimplification about how uncomfortable it is to truly challenge a process or a leader as a follower. Especially the lower you are in the hierarchy. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So, and the organization and your relationship with that leader, um, that leader's personal experiences and their personal desires. I mean, I just, while it's not an incorrect statement, I just remember reading a few of these. I think I even wrote here that that's really hopeful. Um, Hopeful? Not helpful. Hopeful. 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 Pie in the sky? Yes. Yes. But that... 
it's like it is hopeful, which is good too. I think I right. think it's okay to be hopeful, but I just felt like and again, that's just a little personal bias. Yeah, so the the authors do mention in the article that there's been a, a lot of research done on on the leader's effectiveness on decreasing burnout amongst the like followers, like underneath the, the leader. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's very little research done on, on how followers can decrease burnout by taking ownership of, of their role. And I think there's a reason for that because I think it's not as prevalent. As well, and to my point, that's why I feel like if you're going to evaluate people on leadership, you have to hold them accountable for followership. Right. So I 1000% agree with what you said, that the onus is on a follower to do these things. But the follower is getting zero credit for that. Other than if the boss just likes them and they think, you know what I mean? They're not getting that acknowledgement for that really great tangible skill right. that is probably used nine out of 10 times versus leadership. Right. So, yeah, that was my last one, I think. That was your final thought? Mm, hold on. There was one others. Do you have one more final takeaway before I close it out? Leaders can be proactive in removing barriers for followers as they work through projects or are trying to solve problems. I overwhelmingly this is from the article. This right? is from yeah. the article. I overwhelmingly agreed with that sentence, and it. Can you I, read it one more time? Leaders can be proactive in removing barriers for followers as they work through projects or are trying to resolve or solve problems. Right. So. I don't know. I remember uh, one of my, so we have reservists in in the Coast Guard. They are, you know, part-time employees is the best way you could describe them. You know, they work one weekend a month, two weeks a year. They come on active duty. They can go fill positions in hurricane response. They do special assignments all over, and they just maintain proficiency in, in the service. And I remember when I was leaving, I've had really great reservists. I've been very... I've had good crews. I'm not going to say I've been very fortunate because, I mean, for all my intents and purpose, all of them are great because all the ones I've worked with are great. Right. So I just remember when I was leaving, um, the senior senior reservist said, you know, thanks for, I felt like he just said thanks for doing what I thought was my job. And um, I really was like, well, I appreciate that, but you guys do all the work. They really do. They did everything. I didn't do anything. I came in on the, I came in every once in a while and kind of, you know, BS with them and just talk to them and ask them how the real world was. But he said that I removed barriers, and I didn't really understand what he meant by that. Right. I'm still trying to figure out, and I'm not really sure which barriers I removed. Um, I know he said one of them was just a relationship with the with at the time I was in command, the relationship with the command. He just said, you know, he's felt like there's been a little bit of a barrier there. And so you I, opened up the channels of communication. Yes. So, right. but I didn't know I did that. <laughs> so that was pretty cool um, to hear. And so when I saw it here, um, all I thought I was doing, so now I'm going to oversimplify, so, you know, I'm going to accuse them of oversimplifying something and then I'm going to really oversimplify their statement, the, the authors. I just always want to get to yes, you know, get to yes. Like, don't start it. No, start it. Let's see how we can make this work. Start at least at maybe. Right. And then work to yes. And if working to yes, you're like, well, we really can't get to yes. Then I I kind of accept that more than just not. And so that's really what I thought that sentence was. And when I was thinking about what do they mean by removing barriers, I think that that's, I just felt like that's the only thing I could think of that maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Let me have that compliment is that I just remember always wanting to get to yes. You know, they'd ask me to do something. I didn't always agree. <laughs> right. But I was like, all right, well, maybe. Right. And then we would work towards yes. So I did. Kudos to the authors for pointing that out. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's one of the things that I try to teach other people when they ask me, you know, what's what's something to work on. It's like, again, going back to being that follower, research the problem. Figure it out. Right. And get to yes. And, and, and try to come up with some solutions, right? Mm-hmm. Research the problem and try to come up with some viable solutions that hopefully allow the leadership side to get to yes, mm-hmm. right? Whatever that is, you know, give them the best options, right? If you research a problem enough, hopefully you have some, some viable options to get to yes. Yep. So. So that was really, 
my last note. Well, and I think I'll just close out with, with one of my, my favorite concepts is the fertile soil, mm-hmm. right? It's everyone's responsibility to kind of create that fertile soil environment in the organization where people can grow and people can flourish. And for that to happen, you know, it's, again, it is a two-way street between leaders and followers. I always say that leaders or followers are not, you know, not just a passive cork bobbing on the organizational surface, right? They're not just hapless and, you know, at the whims of, of all the leaders, because again, all the leaders are also followers. So again, every leader in the organization can look upwards and say, you know, blame the leader above them. So uh, fertile soil, you know, how are the plants going to grow? Hopefully they got enough uh, nutrients in the soil and, and the yeah. followers are empowered to speak up and create better conditions for themselves. Yeah, and they did, to your point, they did discuss, which I also thought was great, they actually defined, you know, they separated the difference between a leader and a follower. You know, leadership in this article is, you know, by practice, they're in the positions of responsibility. Authority. But not authority. Not authority. Whereby they're influenced to execute the vision of their leaders or accomplish their organizational goals. Right. And then it goes on, and I thought this was a good distinction between the leader and the follower dynamic, that leaders should bear the burden of, leaders shoulder the burden of responsibility for their decisions. They must own the success or failure of the mission. Right. And I just, I thought that was a really good distinction between knowing when you are in that leadership position and when you're in that followership position. Right. So... Uh, appreciate those final thoughts. I think uh, that's good for us. I think we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we appreciate it. Um, hit the subscribe button. Really appreciate that. Join the Facebook Leadosophy group. Send me a message. It's uh, Just search Leadosophy on Facebook if you want to join the private group. We didn't use any sound effects. Can we like throw one in? Just you want to, how about, our little Leadosophy right. owl, right? It's the, uh, the symbol of wisdom, right? Leadosophy, or for, you know, for some people it might be a, kind of a, superstitious thing right so who knows so appreciate that thanks for watching thanks for listening wherever you're at we'll catch you next time thanks for watching and listening to another episode of leadosophy if you liked what you heard today hit that subscribe button and check out leadosophy.com and learn more about tim's ideas on philosophy and leadership we'll see you next time